Hi, Ivan. Welcome to the Devico Breakfast Bar. Thanks for joining me today. Could you please start uh, by telling us a bit about yourself and your journey in the tech business space? Uh, good morning, Oleg. Thanks for having me. My name is Ivan Batanov. I've been in the tech space for quite some time. I started when the internet was in its infancy, um, and then I was lucky enough to uh, join Yahoo uh, when it was uh, the most popular place on the internet, which taught me a lot of interesting lessons uh, about scalability and what's possible. From there, I worked at Microsoft, and then for the past 15 years, I've been focused on building and running and engineering teams in the enterprise SaaS space. I was part of ServiceNow in the early days, then I was a CTO of a company called Kairiva in the treasury management space. After that, I spent several years in marketing technology with a company called Telium. And now I'm a head of engineering at a company called Crux Data, which does ETL for unstructured and semi-structured data, again, for enterprise customers. Thanks. Can you share some examples of projects that have in particular significant in your professional journey, especially in terms of growth and transformation. Yeah, absolutely. Starting at Yahoo in the days when the internet was kind of exploding and the days when images were getting bigger and bigger and video was becoming popular, we had a big challenge of how to support our growing customer base, which was measured in billions of viewers and trillions of payload, trillions of page loads, very big and very fast growing numbers. So we had to do a lot of innovation in-house. We built our own CDN just so we can support the business, which was in itself a very exciting project. And with a lot of lessons learned about how to build and run very large scale global infrastructure. Okay. Are there any key lessons or principles that have been instrumental in your career that you would like to share with our audience? Uh, I mean, I think one of the things that I learned over time and I strongly believe in is the idea of pragmatic innovation, that innovation needs to be driven by um, pragmatic business need, you know, which mm -hmm. helps align business strategy and engineering strategy kind of all in one. And actually helps build a better product. And when you look at all of the kind of revolutionary software technologies that really changed the way we store data, consume data, they were all built by companies because they had a particular need that the market didn't offer a solution to. So that's how they ended up building it. For example, DynamoDB, you know, the predecessor, which product called Dynamo, which Amazon built for internal use, just because there was nothing like it in the database market. So Amazon ended up building their own, then in turned into one of the most successful database products out there. Great. As an avid competitive seller, you are familiar with uh, the predictability and changing conditions in sailing, much like in business. Charles Chase, one of our previous guests, likened business to sailing in terms of unexpected shifts and challenges. Do you find that your sailing experience influences your approach to leadership and decision making in the IT sector? Oh, definitely. Sailing, you know, very much like business occurs, occurs in a non-predictable environment. We don't control what the markets are going to do. We don't control what our competitors are going to do very much in sailing we don't control the weather we don't control our competitors so being able to make decisions and just your approach or tactics and strategy is very similar to business there's a couple of analogies that in my opinion apply very strongly to any business one is an idea by one of the big american sailors buddy melges that is this pyramid where at the bottom is boat handling then it's boat speed, then it's tactics, and then the top is strategy, where the takeaway is that if the fundamentals of your business are not solid, it doesn't matter what kind of strategy and tactics you apply, it's not going to be competitive because you just don't have the basics. This very much like if you're running an engineering team and your basic processes are not very well oiled, the CACD, um, quality, how we plan, how we deliver, um, then it doesn't matter what kind of product strategy you're going to end up with. You're just not going to be able to deliver on time and on budget. And then 
The other idea that I thought about uh, recently is the idea of what we call speed loop, which is a very fast-paced communication between the members of a sailing team about keeping the belt at, at optimal speed at all times. The same idea applies to business as well. When you have all the parts of the business in a constant communication about what's working and what's not working, then you can respond much more rapidly and run your business much more efficiently. So thanks for the detailed answer. I, I totally agree with everything you said. Uh, are there any professionals or leaders in your network who inspire you in your professional journey? Um, so, I mean, I, I was uh, lucky to have been able to work with some really amazing leaders throughout the time. David Filo, one of the founders of Yahoo, and then David Henkin, Raj Patel at Yahoo, my manager at Microsoft, uh, Arna, the CEO of Kariba, um, Jean-Luc, quite a few uh, outstanding people. The CTO of uh, Tilia, Mike Anderson, he's a serial entrepreneur and really amazing guy. Also, the team I work with, Crux, so yeah, quite a few amazing leaders that taught me a lot. Great. As someone deeply involved in technology, what emerging trends do you find most promising for the future? Yeah, I mean, right now, all the rage is about Gen AI and all the possibilities there. But I think the underlying trend under Gen AI is that compute and storage is becoming exponentially cheaper over time, which opens the possibilities to do all kinds of discoveries which five or ten years ago would have taken amount of time greater than humanity has been on earth now things take minutes and seconds like mo models with billions of parameters run in sub-second execution time apple published a paper running large language models on a mobile phone so increasing compute power uh, and storage just makes a lot of things uh, possible so I think we're going to see a lot of discoveries in material science, physics, chemistry, biology, genome analysis over the next several years are going to be just radical and groundbreaking, just uh, things that we can't imagine today. Thanks. How do you balance the need for innovation with the practicalities of delivering software products and services? So I'll go back to the pragmatic innovation. People talk about this healthy tension between product and engineering that's in kind of a traditional world. Product managers want their features, engineers want their, quote, innovation. But I think if we turn this thing sideways and look at it as we're doing all of this together and all the engineering innovation is treated just as any other feature. So the same way we would ask a product manager, why do you think we should build feature X, Y, and Z and we should... <clears throat> go after this additional functionality, there has to be an answer because it's incremental revenue, better user experience. Mm -hmm. it, it needs to be rationalized the same way when you ask an engineer, so why do you think we should do something? Why should we replace our data storage model or why we should replace our UI? There has to be a well-substantiated reason. Why are we going to do this? That okay. conversation becomes not about healthy tension between how much you're going to get and how much I'm going to get. It becomes a conversation about, given what we have, what is the best mix of, let's call it engineering innovation and actual feature work that's going to take us where we want to go, that's best aligned with our business strategy. Okay. I see that you're very practical and rational in your daily work. Thank you. As a leader, how do you identify and cultivate talent within your teams? What strategies do you employ for talent development and retention? Well, you know, the talent development and retention, I don't think there is a kind of a quick and easy answer to that. I think it's a kind of a full circle challenge that every leader needs to solve. We all went through the 2019, 2020 demand for talent, where talent retention was the most critical thing, because if you start losing talent, you can't recruit and hire fast enough. So I think the approach is alignment between your recruiting, interviewing. You have to align the people that you seek, recruit, and interview with the strategy. Mm -hmm of the business, where do we want the business to go? So what type of people do we want to recruit? 
than aligning gen- the engineering team's culture with that goal. So if we want a culture of learning, we have to just promote learning and provide both the time for people to actually learn. And then we have to provide them tools. Thankfully, nowadays, information, training, and all kinds of resources are readily available, a lot of them for free. It's not just a matter of buying a learning management system or Udemy or a product like that. It's about creating culture of innovation and celebrating that innovation and rewarding the people that innovate, right? And the other thing is that you have to make sure that your teams have the right mix of skill sets. There's people that really thrive on figuring out what's next and how to do something better or learning the latest technology. Then there's people that thrive on just getting things done and it takes both kinds to actually build a successful team. Because if you have a team that has only people that want to learn and do the latest thing and innovate, then at one point you end up innovating for innovation's sake. That's why it takes a balance of personalities to actually build a high-performing team. Okay. Technology is constantly evolving. How do you prioritize and engage in continuous learning to stay ahead in the tech landscape and how do you encourage your teams to do the same? I mean, you know, this, this goes back to the previous question. So personally, I allocate time for myself to read. It's kind of a two-tiered uh, process. I read about what people read, right? I have kind of my favorite authors that publish on LinkedIn and other media, things that they find interesting and things that they read. And then Out of these, I pick things that interest me and I just allocate time to read. I'm one of the people who actually really finds joy in learning new things. And then as far as a bigger organization, starting with the interviewing process, if you recruit people that thrive on learning and then you provide them with the time and motivation to do it, you know, just happens. If you build a culture of engineering innovation where innovation is celebrated, then that's kind of the natural driver for people to actually learn and figure out how to do things in a new way or how to do new things. Then it becomes a positive feedback loop. Somebody learns something, they do something that gets recognized or celebrated. Different companies, we've done different things like hackathons or engineering innovation award for the quarter or for a person or a team. And once it gets started, then it becomes a positive positive reinforcement cycle that somebody else says, wow, that's great. Now I want to be the guy that crushed the hackathon or I want to be recognized as the most innovative engineer of the quarter. And they put in the time and the effort and it happens. But when you see it, when it actually happens and you see the entire organization thriving on innovation, it's pretty amazing, right? Mm -hmm. Then most people in the organization are really stoked and they want to be part of it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Could you comment on the challenges associated with the shortage of qualified specialists in the IT sector, particularly in relation to your business? Yeah, absolutely. The demand for technologists, engineers, product managers, UI designers is growing exponentially. I think if we look at the number of software companies and the number of products that are getting built, that greatly exceeds the throughput of colleges, universities, and kinds of training organizations that supply talent. So there's more demand than supply. I think during COVID and like 2018 to 2021, we went through a really severe shortage of talent. Combined also with a great deal of venture capital and public and private equity investment in technology companies, I mean, finding developers was like finding the holy grail especially in the middle of COVID when many businesses realize that they must go digital and they find that, okay, we need developers. It was very challenging and we had to employ all kinds of recruiting tools and strategies to even be able to find and locate people because posting on job boards and all this just didn't didn't it it didn't work. So many job postings. I think even nowadays with all the layoffs and slowing down in hiring, still there, there, there is people on the market, but hiring is still not straightforward. Agree. 
Uh, yeah. Could you share insights into how development teams uh, are typically structured in your projects? Have you ever outsourced your tech needs to an external yeah. vendor? Yeah, so I think these two questions go hand in hand. My strong preference is to organize teams in self-sufficient squads or agile teams or scrum teams. Different organizations call them differently, but basically in self-sufficient units where all the necessary skill sets or as many as feasible reside within the team. So engineering, quality, product management, they're all part of the same team. Maybe not necessarily reporting into the same leader, but nevertheless, they form an independent team that ultimately is responsible for one, two or more features or parts of the product. So aligned with the product functionalities, you know, functional teams, or, or you can call them also feature teams. So once you organize your teams that way, that makes the task of moving work from one location or in-source, outsource to another option much more portable because kind of slicing the work in the other direction. Let's just say we're going to put engineering in one place and we're going to put QA in another place. This organizational setup has a lot of inherent friction or a need for communication that actually slows down productivity. Have you ever outsourced your tech needs to someone external? Here, I want to bring a little bit of clarity to this question. There's two things. One is outsourcing. The other one is offshoring. And I think they're used very interchangeably. And when we talk about outsourcing, there's a couple of different things that go under outsourcing. One is outsourcing non-core businesses. So mm -hmm. if something is not your core competency, you may want to consider outsourcing. The other thing that goes behind outsourcing is outsourcing particular confined tasks or set of tasks. For example, building a design system. If you don't have a strong design team, you can outsource it. And then the third thing is outsourcing the actual engineering team. Having work in companies where engineering is the core competence of the organization, I have used outsourced vendors to help provide resources, but all these resources are part of the core engineering team. Mm -hmm. So basically so, dedicated teams. Dedic yeah, yeah. What, what you would call dedicated teams. And at that point, whether they are outsourced, meaning whether they're employed by company X and company X sends me an invoice every month for the resources or these resources are employed by my company and we pay them directly. That is a conversation that is actually not all that interesting. It's more of a means of employment than actual outsourcing. And of course, if we, if we were to go to a company, they take care of local management, hiring, recruiting, and all yeah. that. Uh, once the team becomes operational, it just becomes a matter of, you know, do you employ the team directly or you go to third party in a particular country. What were the precise factor that prompted you to consider IT outsourcing? I, mean, I think there's three big drivers, right? One is just the shortage of talent. The second thing is th th there is still cost benefits to be gained by hiring engineers abroad. These cost differences are becoming more and more uh, minute. And I think probably over the next 10 years, we'll see that equalize even more. The days when you can hire engineers abroad for like 1,000 or 2,000 hours a month, I think these days are over, but there's still yeah. significant cost savings to be gained, particularly if you're looking at teams in the hundreds or thousands of people. And then the third thing is just being able to take advantage of the 24-hour cycle and build a follow the sun model where you have people in one time zone and then you have another team in eight ten hours time zone away from it so then if you're running 24 by 7 operation you don't have yeah. to have people do graveyard shift which makes hiring and retention very complicated yeah makes sense what are the benefits and drawbacks of outsourcing i think the the benefits go hand in hand with the reason why we're doing it right there's more availability of talent and mm -hmm. there's significant cost savings to be gained. But on another hand, I think going to an outsourced or generally offshore model kind of magnifies all the problems within the organization 
very quickly. If the team's big processes are not very well established or they're not very efficient, things that were amassed by the fact that we are all in the same time zone, and particularly when we're all in the office, you can walk mm-hmm. to somebody's desk and say, can you help me out with this? When that person is 10 hours or 12 hours or even five hours away, five time zones away, and it's not in the same office, becomes a uh, a challenge, right? And then these issues multiplied by 10, 100 or 1,000 people really become a major source of friction and frustration for everybody in the organization. Like in sailing, first, you got to get your boat handling and basic processes of how we distribute work, how we mm-hmm. commit work, how we test work, how we deploy, because in office, same time zone model, deployment broke, you called somebody from the DevOps team and say, hey, my deployment broke. He's like, yeah, I'll fix it. Don't worry about it. But when the DevOps person is 10 time zones away, you have to wait until tomorrow. You lost half a day or a whole day waiting for something to get done just because it wasn't good to start with. So that's why I think Mm -hmm. this model just kind of puts a magnifying glass on a lot of issues that otherwise remain unnoticed. Okay, great. How do you measure the success of collaboration with an IT outsourcing vendor? To me, the success of an outsourcing vendor is that we don't consider them an outsourced vendor. Because my philosophy is that if the team that we've, quote, outsourced builds the core product of the company, they should feel like they are part of the company and they're aligned on what we're doing why we're doing it. So at this point, the more the outsourced team feels like they're not outsourced, that's success, right? Otherwise, you know, there's changing market dynamic in one country. I mean, imagine what happens. Microsoft opens an office in a country. They want to hire a thousand people in one day. We're probably going to lose people pretty quickly because just it's how it happens. You can't blame it on your partner, right? And finally, what advice would you give to other companies considering IT outsourcing? My advice goes back to what you said, what the challenges are. I found it, and I've tried it both ways. I found much easier to spend maybe three months, maybe six months, setting up your in-house organization to run smoothly between... Mm -hmm. Product planning, backlog grooming, kind of end-to-end from idea until the code hits production. Make sure that all the processes are reasonably well documented. I mean, depending on the stage and phase of the company, you don't want to build too much process for process sake, but things are reasonably well documented and the processes are well internalized because When you bring another 30, 50 people tomorrow that don't know your processes, don't know what the company does, may not even connect to kind of the subject matter of what the company does, may not be native English speakers, all these problems are going to get magnified uh, very quickly. So if you can preempt and get these things sorted out, then onboarding a remote team becomes very easy and successful, right? Then the other thing that I've become a very strong advocate for, and I've tried it over multiple companies is it really helps if you have KPIs from your development process. So you have a kind of a speed dial of how every team is doing. And then at least in the beginning, you, you do very frequent agile retrospectives, or there's multiple ways of soliciting feedback in a way, like this gentleman, David Henke, who I worked for at Yahoo, I used to say, attack the problem, not the people. So people mm-hmm. feel safe to say this thing is not working or this thing is inefficient or this thing is really problematic for us. And then you go and you fix it because when somebody is 10, 12 hours away and maybe they, they don't understand who in the organization can, can help them with what and what's allowed, what's not allowed, things look very different. So getting this mm-hmm. kind of feedback is very important. And then, I mean, at one point after three, six months, when the teams become fully operational and they're kind of going at full speed, 
then onboarding more people, more teams is pretty straightforward. Okay, great. Ivan, thanks for your time. Thanks for the efficient conversation. I do believe that our listeners will find your answers pretty useful for them, I'm sure. You're one of the most interesting guests I've ever had, at least very precise, very pragmatic. Thanks for that. Thanks for your time and uh, yeah, wishing you all the best. Thanks, Alec. Thanks for having me and have a great day. Thank you.